Can you tell us something about the history of the building and why so many people feel strongly that it should be saved from demolition? When it comes to saving the, the building, I think we, we, we do have to look at that history of what it came out of. And th this building was built as a consequence of the green bands in the, the early 1970s. The Rocks Green Band was perhaps the best known of these and it was lifted specifically so that this building, the Sirius Building, could be built to house the people who had lived in the rocks and in this area. It was also quite innovative because there was a real determination to design in a sense of community in terms of the way the building was configured. Yes, it was at a time when I think uh, Housing Commission, public housing in Australia was having a bit of trouble trying to work out how to do more dense living. They'd built some high-rise uh, uh, apartments and they really weren't being very successful. This was an attempt to build a whole community in a, in a vertical building that did work as community and it, it did it by a couple of ways. Uh, one was it, it provided some very large uh, and, and uh, uh, quite a variety of community spaces both inside and outside, some used by everybody, some just by some of the older people that were in the units, some that could be booked separately, some that were outside, some that connected to courtyards. There was this, this variety of spaces as well as the individual units that people lived within. So they provided this sort of complex uh, living arrangement, a bit like you do find in a community. And, and in addition to that, there was another element that was unique in this building. For the first time, housing combined families, large and small, with uh, older residents. And this, this was a, a, an unusual thing to do, but hugely successful. You had the same cross-section of people that you'd find in society, and you pushed them together so that they did uh, form this strong, bonded community. Well, let's have a look at some of the exterior architectural features which made this building a very distinctive kind of construction, and uh, actually quite unusual for its time. Let's just pan up towards the facade, as you can see, a modular construction, uh, rather like Lego brick blocks piled on top of each other. And uh, here and there, the roofs of the lower blocks are also used as uh, upper terraces for the uh, tenants living further up the building. Yes, yes, that, that is right. It's, it's unusual in that nearly every level has access to a rooftop garden. And those gardens were seen as an integral part of providing exterior spaces for, for groups of people uh, on th those floors and other floors to come and enjoy both the views but also that sort of communal way of living together. Now also I know she was saying how it's modular and certainly there are modular elements and it has a modular look about it. The, the window um, constructions, they're modular concrete uh, uh, pieces that have slotted into position and the whole design of the building is, is modular but when you look closely of course there's that off form concrete huge mass going up the whole 10 floors. So there were modules slotted into uh, an off form concrete structure. Now Sirius, given this modular nature, is sometimes compared with the famous Habitat 67 apartment complex in Montreal in Canada, designed by the Israeli-Canadian architect Moshe Safdie back in the mid-1960s. And uh, it, it actually opened at the same time as the international 1967 exposition in Montreal. Uh, there are significant differences. You could say that the similarities are somewhat superficial, but there are also uh, some major similarities. For example, uh, both complexes were designed to provide affordable accommodation uh, in a very civilized, as you say, uh, urban environment, encouraging uh, a sense of community and uh, both with fantastic views in the case of Habitat. Looking east, you look out onto the waters of the St. Lawrence. Looking back to the west, you see the, the towers of the uh, Montreal Central Business District. Here, um, on the other side, you can look down at uh, the Opera House and uh, glittering Sydney Harbour. Uh, that vision, giving affordable housing or providing affordable housing to people who really couldn't afford otherwise to live in this kind of area was very much an idea of its time and probably a bit old-fashioned today. Yes, it, it is seen, seen as old-fashioned today and uh, there's this feeling of almost separating our city so that the people who traditionally lived in this area and th this area, you must remember, 40 years ago was not popular. It wasn't a desirable place to live 
people thought of it as the slums, and and in fact uh, the the pushing away of the of the uh, what we now see as the heritage houses that was slum clearance, and now these houses are greatly valued, and this is also greatly valued as the role it had in saving those houses, and as also being part of a complicated, interesting uh, environment rather than all of one type. Uh, so, in all sorts of ways, it, it did yes, it did uh, connect with uh, habitat and it's in. in ways it was designed, but I think uh, Teo, the architect, Teo Gophers would maintain, he didn't copy uh, the ideas of that, he sort of came up with something similar by going through a design process. And I think he likes to think this, uh, this as his singular uh, design, that, that it certainly was influenced by a lot of uh, thoughts and ideas at the time, but he didn't just uh, put those together to come up with a design, he came up with a design that drew on those elements from around the world that were really vibrant at that moment in time. So, and that, so very much a, a product of, of their time in a way. Yes, I, both, I, both I think so. It, yeah. it, we now tend to call it a, a late brutalist building, and that, that use of its off-form concrete and, and the raw materials, the, the, the celebration of uh, materials, the, the, the very straightforward uh, use of them and expression of them, and then using it within a, 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 a I suppose, a um, an environment that's for, for the social good. That makes it work particularly well as a building, it makes it a very good example of brutalism, which Teo at the time said he was not particularly aware of as a style uh, at the time. Now, of course, most, in fact, virtually all the residents have been moved out into other accommodation, and uh, this is no longer going to be uh, a place where you can get affordable accommodation. But there's another issue, isn't there? And that is the question of uh, what is defined as heritage? Um, should this building be preserved, sold to private developers who can then renovate it or restore it, uh, or should it be demolished and replaced with something else? And th that really is a separate issue, isn't it? It's not really a separate issue. It's actually, it actually does knit together because part of the heritage of this building is in fact that history of the people that lived here and fought in the rocks to save this precinct. That important history of the Green Bands is an essential element of this building, but but you're right. There is also the building itself, and why why you might preserve a building like that, and uh, and whether you keep it or demolish it. Um, I think first of all, our, our hope would be it still has a substantial amount of the building used for social housing. But it, it, it's a, such a fine example of brutalist architecture in its own right. And when it comes to what makes a heritage building, in this case, uh, the government. Uh, it actually appointed a, a whole panel of experts and this is the, the Heritage Council and asked them to make recommendations of what should be deemed worthwhile keeping it unanimously on two criteria put forward serious in, in 2016 and of the 16 buildings were put forward which is a very small number of buildings for a state as large as New South Wales from 16 buildings only one was singled out and the government said we don't think this this particular building should have heritage listing and its entire argument was based on the economics that it was going to have undue hardship uh, associated with maintaining and keeping this building uh, as a state government so uh, that that was the, the the basic argument around this so do you think in this context the the, the serious complex whatever its eventual fate could help to raise public awareness of how heritage is more than just preserving Georgian and Victorian buildings, a battle that to some extent was won back in the 1970s with the green, back, uh, with the green bands here in the rocks. Yes, I, I think initially if you ask people about heritage buildings they do think of Georgian and, and Victorian buildings and somewhere like Sydney we have some incredibly fine uh, sandstone buildings and it gives a lot the character of our city but there's another part of the character of our city which is we were back there and if you look around Sydney now it's turning into a city of, of shiny skyscrapers and there is that question if you take out this middle group of buildings and just slice them out of history and demolish them there comes the question how do we get from those sandstone buildings up to the contemporary buildings of today in Sydney. So that heritage should be explaining an entire story of a city. And I think that's what we're saying.